Hi, everybody. In a moment, we're going to introduce ourselves. Uh, I realize you hear my voice, but you maybe can't see my face. Um, but I do want to take a moment to talk about this tool, nativeland.ca, that all of you just looked at, and maybe you looked up the, the name of the, the people whose traditional land that you are on currently. Now, this is a super, super cool tool. That is the, the information is all crowdsourced. Um, However, it is limited. Now this tool has become kind of popular on different social media platforms and also in the classroom. And it's a great way to uh, introduce people who aren't familiar to the idea that native people uh, traditionally lived in, in spaces that, that many of us now occupy. The limitation, however, of this tool is that often when you put in the zip code, it's going to give you like the general tribe that occupied a certain that whose traditional land uh, is that specific area that you're looking at. However, it is important to remember that within these large areas, there are actually lots of smaller tribes and tribal groups that are also from those lands. And so they, those groups might have different names, they might have different languages, um, but they might be missing from the map. The reason I'm, I am bringing this up is that if you are native, you might have put in your zip code and found that your tribe was missing. I know that this is what happened to me when I put in my tribe, we were missing from the map. And I'm bringing this up today because if when you did this activity, you noticed that your tribe was missing, you can actually email native lands and they will add you to the map. This is super, super important. It's a great way for native people to give input into improving a tool like this that is meant to increase our visibility in the public's understanding of who we are. So that's my plug for nativeland.ca. We can begin now. <laughs> um, real quick before we begin though, I did wanna just, uh, we wanna make a shout out to the educators and teachers and anyone that's really working a at home Zoom job right now, we understand that you probably just finished eight hours of sitting in front of a camera at your computer desk. Um, and we really wanna thank you for taking the time to show up here and continue doing things on Zoom. So thank you so much for being here. Your support means a lot and we really hope you get a lot out of tonight. Um, and also I was just so excited to see how many different places, different tribes are represented here, different lands. Uh, it was really great to see the diversity that we have just in this small group. Um, so I, I posted the link to the raffle in the chat. We have some really wonderful items that are up for raffle made by Irma, who is one of our panelists today. Um, so go ahead, there's still a little bit of time for you to put your name into that raffle and we'll be raffling those things off later in the night. All right, let's get started. Can, I, can everybody see me? Can you see me, Maddie? I can see you, yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 Hi, everybody. My name is Taylor Pennywell. Um, I am a teacher by trade. I have a master's in teaching. However, I'm also a citizen of the Time Maidu tribe in Berry Creek, California, and I'm the executive director of Redbud Resource Group. Hi, everyone. My name is Madison Esposito. I am a master's of public health. I'm also a citizen of the Time Maidu Nation, and I'm the vice president of operations here at Redbud. And before we begin, we want to give our sponsor, because we are co-hosting this event with Four Winds of Indian Education, an opportunity to introduce themselves and what they do. Hi, <laughs> I'm Nathan Hack. I'm a non-native ally. I'm working with Four Winds of Indi Indian Education in the Neeson Palm Grant, which is our college and career readiness grant. Uh, Neeson Palm means uh, family surf Lomido. And the first goal of our grant is to transform schools into uh, high performing, culturally responsive learning communities. And we do that by providing cultural sensitivity training for educators, as well as provide a comprehensive um, services to students for student success so they can reach uh, college and career readiness goals. Uh, so I wanna thank Madison and Taylor for bringing this work to us and thank all the panelists for uh, celebrating this educator guide and sharing this important work. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Good evening, everyone. My name is Irma Amaro. Uh, I am a Yaqui and Chicana. I grew up in Southern California and have been in Northern California for, oh, probably 40 years. Uh, Northern California started in Humboldt County 
and then went over to Shasta County and then down to Butte County. So um, I have been learning ever since um, I left high school, you know, still learning, going into various communities, um, Indian communities uh, that welcome me with, um, with open arms and with their knowledge and understanding. Um, I get a lot of understanding uh, through the different tribes that I've been um, part of uh, in their communities. Four Winds is one of 23 American Indian education, education centers in the state of California, funded by the California Department of Education. We have an American Indian Education Center funding along with tobacco, um, use prevention education where we uh, advocate for traditional use of tobacco, um, but also are against uh, commercial tobacco products. Um, you know, we always have to advocate for the use of tobacco in our communities and our native communities. And um, so Along with that, we also partner with the different tribes in Butte County. We have the Machupta, the Berry Creek, the Moortown uh, Enterprise. Uh, also in Glen, in Glen County, we have Grindstone that we um, work with also. Uh, also with the University of California Chico, Butte College. Um, again, Four Winds is part of the educational programs in, uh, in Butte County. So I wanna thank everybody for being here um, and listening to our presentation. Thanks, Irma. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about what we do at Redbud. We help the people that we work with build alliances, increase native visibility, support tribal sovereignty, and also improve cultural understanding. And we do this through the development of lots of different projects and resources. We create, we work on academic research, we create education and teaching guides, like the one that you are learning about and celebrating tonight, cultural competency and understanding materials. We can support with cultural consulting, also organizational and program assessments. We have a big one that's gonna be released in March and then also curriculum. Um, and we work with a lot of different people. We work with museums, cultural centers, we worked with tribal governments, we worked with teachers um, at the county level and the district level, but also with individual teachers. So we uh, really partner with a wide range of, of people. And today you are all here to celebrate and support the release of our guide. I have a copy of it right here. It's Seeing Our Native Students, a guide for educators, and we're really excited. Turns out that writing a book is really hard and tedious, and we're really happy that it's done and that we have it, you know, a hard copy of it. Um, for all of you to access if you so desire. So there are copies of it for free on Redbud Resource Group as a, a .org as a PDF. And then there's also hard copies of it if you want a hard copy um, that is in our store. And so please go to redbudresourcegroup.org. We also have a brand new website that is really beautiful that was launched this week. So we'd love for you to visit and check out the work in detail. But before we go into the contents of the guide, uh, we, Maddie and I are both gonna tell a little bit about our experience in education and how it influenced the, um, the creation of the guide. So when I was young, I grew up in Sonoma County and my grandmother was really the person that I relied on as my cultural knowledge bearer. I was very, very close with my grandmother. And so the things that I learned about my culture and my tribal community really came from her directly. And my family, we kept that information really closed off, like within the direct family. And so what that meant is when I went to school as an elementary school student in public school, I very, very rarely talked about my identity or my culture in the classroom. And there were a couple of reasons for, for this that maybe other Native people can, can relate to. One was that I really didn't want to be questioned by the teacher like I didn't want the teacher to put me on the spot to see if I knew enough information for my identity to be legitimate. I didn't want to be questioned. And then the other reason is that I didn't want to have to be like an educator. I didn't want to have to teach 
my friends or even my teachers, the people who are my superiors about native culture. And it, and it sometimes like native people get put on the spot and are expected to be able to, to answer questions to things that they don't have the information to answer. And so I, instead of like dealing with those conflicts and that tension, I just avoided it completely by not talking about my identity or my cultural identity. Now, what happened was when I was in my early 20s, I became a teacher and it was very apparent that I had native students in my classroom for me, like most classrooms in the United States have native students in them, whether or not we realize it. And what I saw was that my students were exhibiting the same thing, the same behavior that I was. They didn't want to talk about their identity. They didn't want to talk about their culture. They really just kind of wanted to lay low and like exist under the radar. And what made me realize as an adult that it is super, super important that our native and indigenous children have a strong sense of cultural identity and pride in who they are. And one way of getting them there is by making sure that the adults that influence them have the understanding of those identities so that they can offer support. So that was kind of my experience and how it how it led to wanting to create this guide. Yeah, and so my experience growing up was pretty similar to Taylor's. Um, and I thought things would be a little different when I started college and then even more different when I went to graduate school. Um, I thought that visibility of native peoples would increase. I'd be able to talk to people and they, they'd know what I meant when I said I was native and they wouldn't question me, it would be a whole obstacle to go through just to tell someone who I am. Um, but as I'm sure most of the natives in this audience that have gone to um, you know, undergraduate or graduate school, that's not really the case. You run into a similar level of ignorance even at that higher level of education. And so when I started my graduate program, I was going to classes that focused on health disparities. And Native people experience extreme health disparities. We in our communities have the highest level of diabetes, heart disease, um, you know, obesity, all of these issues, these preventable diseases that we are dealing with. And yet I went to class, we never talked about it. We never talked about the disparities, the issues of health and wellness that Native people are encountering every day. And the fact that we don't have the support, the resources that we need to overcome those health disparities. And in one of my first classes in my graduate program, I was asked to write a paper about a population in the Boston area that needed help gaining better access to prenatal care. And so of course, everything I do is focused on making actionable items that can be used in the native community. And so the first thing I did is I know there's a lot of natives in Boston. I went to um, a native cultural center that I used to go to a lot when I was living in Boston. I went to one of our clinics, one of the native health clinics and I talked to them. I was like, how would you approach the issue of prenatal health? What would you want from a program to make this work for you in your community? And we wrote this paper together. I thought it was a really wonderful paper, a strong paper. And I turned it in, I was very excited about it because I wanted the feedback to actually turn it into something real that the community could use to start a new program. And instead, the TA who graded my paper gave me an F. And when I asked her about that, I was like, what was wrong? Because obviously I must have done something so wrong to get an F on this paper. And her response was that native people aren't a relevant population in public health in Boston. And I was really confused um, and upset about that. So I asked her again, maybe I'm not understanding the project the right way. Maybe they wanted us to look at a specific community and not just any community that could need this help. But she doubled down. She said that there simply weren't enough natives around for this to be something relevant to write a paper on. And so I, I felt like I had met a brick wall with her and I went to my professor and I told him about what happened. I showed him the email correspondence and he was very empathetic. He apologized. Um, he's actually someone who does a lot of work with indigenous communities globally. So he understands the issues that we face as colonized peoples. And he promised he would talk to this TA and that things would change. But I was at that school for two more years and nothing changed. 
I went into classes and still the only time that we talked about native populations, native health, native wellness strategies that native people offer to improve health and wellness was when I brought it up. And so this was really um, one of the driving forces for Taylor and I starting Red Bud to begin with, but also for this guide, is that there needs to be more visibility in all levels of education. We need to have professors that can teach about native health and wellness and the issues that we face at the graduate and the professional level and the K through 12 level. And so I'm hoping that this material can get into the hands of these uh, educators and the next uh, generation of public health professionals medical professionals, people that are going out there and are working to improve health, that they know that we're here, that we exist, and that we have issues that we need help working through. So that, that's my motivation. <laughs> now, Maddie and I's experiences uh, aren't, aren't just ours. They're not unique to us. They're actually backed up by an enormous amount of data. So we're really quickly going to go through this data because it, it's a really big impetus for creating this guide. Yes, yeah, there is, um, I'd really like to emphasize how evidence-based this guide is. Not only is it evidence-based from uh, pieces of research and data that are made by Native peoples, but it's also based on conversations that we had with Native peoples, Native educators, Native parents, Native children, just the entire community, as much data as we could get went into this book. And so the problem that we're confronting here in this book and seeing our Native students, but also throughout Redbud, is the issue of erasure. And if you're unfamiliar with what erasure is, it's essentially the concept that an entire group of people, their culture, history, voices, and sometimes their very existence is completely left out of conversations that impact them. So with the Native community, we see this very saliently in K through 12 education. So this map here to the left, which is from the National Congress of American Indians and their Becoming Visible report. We see that over 50% of states completely omit native education from curricula and standards for K through 12 classes. And this has a real quantifiable impact on native students. Because when you look to this graph on the right from Victoria O'Keefe from the Center of American Indian Health at Johns Hopkins, you can see in the mint color, these are indigenous students that reported feeling erased from their community. They experienced people doubting their identity when they talked about being native. And this extends into even more impactful and larger um, assaults against native people where these native students were experiencing name calling, racist slurs, all the way up to physical violence at the hands of their peers and also members of institutions like police officers. This is a real problem and we are here to do something about it. So very quickly, before I go into some of the uh, meat of the guide, I'm gonna give you a little overview of different parts. There's three main parts. So the first part, part one, is contemporary native identity. And the idea uh, in this section is that in order for teachers to be able to make uh, changes within their classrooms or in their school culture that might uh, improve native people's sense of self and, and all that, that they first need to understand like the political, economic, and cultural context in which native people live. And it for the average American non-native person, this information is not intuitive. It's things that we don't learn about in school. So we've broken down some of the main topics that are really important. The second part is about deficit thinking in schools. So in our groups and in our interviews and in our research, something that came up really regularly was that Native families and students often feel like institutions like public schools uh, kind of treat them with this attitude like they don't actually have what it takes to be successful. And this also comes up in places like social work, where there are assumptions made about the ability of Native parents to take care of their children <laughs> successfully. And so we address some of these patterns of thinking that are really negative and not helpful, and we provide alternative ways of approaching problems that are more strengths-based. And then the third section is we uh, 
directed at teachers and educators and administrators who want to implement concrete changes. So in the upgrading your teacher toolbox section, we provide dozens of concrete strategies for ways that you can improve school culture, ways that you can more meaningfully engage native communities and families in your local area, and also ways that you can improve your content in your classroom. And just to expand a little bit on that contemporary Native identity section, these are the specific topics that we discuss. Now, if you're Native in the audience, you are looking at these things and you're probably going to be very familiar with them. Many of these topics are extremely personal and controversial within the Native community. Things like looking Native, blood quantum, tribal membership, but also topics like historical trauma, how the youth of today, even us, our generation, is has uh, feels the deep impacts of colonialism still to this day. And then we also go over the political context, like uh, the fact that you know native nations, sovereign native nations, exist and are operating and are growing and are also gaining back power within the borders of the United States. It is very very important that any teacher who is teaching and influencing democratic citizens. Uh, understand this system. So we lay it out for you to make it easy. And then in the upgrading your educator toolbox, we go into each of these suggestions in immense detail and give you lots of like specific ways that this might look in your, in your school or classroom. But I really quickly want to give you an overview. So some of our suggestions are creating opportunities for students to strengthen their native identity, investing in staff development so that staff feel comfortable doing this work, engaging and building a relationship with the broader native community in which you teach because if you don't know that they're there, I promise you that there is a native community in the place that you live. Some other suggestions are affirming native knowledge and lesson plans and curricula, making sure that native information is in the lesson plans that you're teaching, uh, building relationships and connecting students with their values because a lot of native education and culture is rooted in values incorporating culturally relevant assessments and then embracing native uh, contemporary native existence. That one is, they're all really important. That one is extremely important. What that one means is talking about us like we still exist. Normally native people are referred to in the past tense only. And this is a major, major issue. So flipping that switch in your heads and our heads so that we're talking about native peoples like we are still here because we are. So that's our general overview. Uh, it looks like some people have already checked out the guide on the website. That's awesome. We'll keep posting the link to the website so that you can check it out. Remember, you can get a free PDF. We want this to be accessible to as many people as possible. So if you want the PDF, download it for free. If you wanna support the organization or you want a hard copy so that you can refer to it over and over again, that's fine. If you, uh, when we run out of printed copies, we will print more. So, um, you know, please be in contact with us and we'd love to support you uh, in getting this resource um, however we can. All right, so time for our first raffle. Very exciting, I see we have 31 people in this raffle. Let's see. Um, Irma, did you want to hold up the, the first thing that will be off for raffle today? Beautiful. Oops. Yes, the first piece is um, an abalone pair of earrings with uh, bear grass um, braids. Whoops, oops, let me see. There we go. <laughs> it's got a light blue um, bead with them. Lovely. That's the first raffle. Okay, great. So let's see here. Raffle item. The first winner is number seven. That's Victoria Garcia. Are you here, Victoria? Let's see here. Yes, she's here. I see her. <laughs> okay, great. All right, Victoria, excellent. Congratulations. Uh, if you want to direct message, the Redbud account, your uh, address will ship those to you. Nice. Okay. The second item is a um, lanyard. So there's the hook on the bottom. It's got black pine nuts, dentillium, uh, glass triangle beads, and some more bear grass braids, 
uh, the beige triangles. Mm -hmm. uh, and Irma, I gotta tell you, teachers love lanyards because it's how we yes. keep track of our classroom keys. So that is like the perfect yes. item for teachers. Also right. for the healthcare workers. Oh yes. Um, you know, for your name badges, just going in and out, just, you know, any kind of staff person. Yeah, um, I used to wear a lanyard that had my badge, my keys, my house keys, like my bike keys. It was about five pounds around my neck at all times. Um, probably not the best idea, but definitely something I did. Um, yes. So <laughs> the second winner is number 22, which is Tacey Crocker. Tacey. Is Tacey here? Yeah, yes. she's, she's here because she was writing in the chat that she really liked <laughs> that <Wow>. item. So <laughs> <It was> super. <laughs> Tacey, go ahead and uh, message <laughs> message uh, Maddie your address and we'll get it to you. Okay, so this next one is more of a contemporary. Because of this pandemic, we're having to wear our masks um, all the time. And, and I know for me, I would, I would take my mask off and put it back on, take it off, set it somewhere and not know where I put it. And this is a lifesaver for me. This is a mask, <laughs> a mask holder. So you've got your, um, you've got your beads. Uh, there you go. This is a black and white and silver one. This one has little tiny, whoops, where is it? Bear grass, black and white bear grass braid right there. Uh, whoops, there you go. And then it goes to the hooks that hook onto your mask. Awesome. And then you just take your mask off and then when you need it, put it back on, take it off, put it back on and it just sits on your chest, the mask and um, less likely of uh, losing it or misplacing it. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, I lose mine. I have uh, the little pocket on my door has like seven masks in it and still I yes. To yeah. Take it out and put so it on anyways, my face. this is a black and white uh, mask holder with some uh, black and white bear grass braided on there, glass bead, whoops, glass beads, and then the hooks on the end to connect to the mask. All right. So our third winner for the night is number 29, which is Rose Collins. And I, I see that you are here, Rose. So uh, direct message me your uh, address and we'll get this to you. Congratulations. Ooh, never gonna lose your mask again. Yeah, congratulations <laughs> everyone. Um, we'll be doing the rest of the items in our second raffle later in the night. Um, thank you so much, Irma, for making all of these beautiful pieces uh, to have here tonight. We're so appreciative. Um, I think we have three. We have three more, right, Irma? Or three or four more items? One, two, three. Well, we could probably do another one. Okay. Okay. We'll do Why four. Not? Because, Why not? Um, okay. So we have another. Whoops. Another lanyard. This one is a uh, brown, uh, brown and gold beads. You have the um, the brown triangles. Triangles, yeah, <laughs> triangles with um, actually a dark brown kind of copper color bear grass. All the bear grass that's colored, because uh, normally the bear grass is a white color, mm -hmm. uh, we dye them um, to get the different colors, the black, the brown, um, just uh, we do red, I do red. Uh, anyways, and so then some more triangles, the brown, it's more like a, a medium color. And I know this light doesn't give it any justice. It's a medium color brown with the dentillium shells. Whoops. And then the braided um, back. Awesome. Beautiful. All right. Yeah. And our fourth winner for the night is number 31, which is Teresa Arsenault. Yes, that's right. That's okay, Teresa. Great. Awesome. That's, that's Congratulations this is you. Arsenal. She is a phenomenal science teacher. So I just want to shout her out because there are lots of teachers in this room or in this, yeah, the Zoom room. So thanks. Teresa, uh, send your address to Maddie. Yeah. 
just uh, direct message it straight to me, or you can email it to uh, the Redbud Gmail, which I'll also put up here. Cool. Great. Awesome. Great. Okay, so then we would have four more. Okay. Okay. Oops, two pairs of earrings <laughs> and um, another mask holder and another lanyard. Great. Awesome. Excellent. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. And so now we're going to move on to the main event, our panel. Um, Taylor's going to start by introducing our panelist. Yeah, of course. So um, unfortunately, Rose wasn't isn't able to be here for the panel today because she had a family situation come up that she wasn't able to miss. And so um, Rose, however, is very well loved. And I know there's lots of people here who who really uh, are looking forward to hearing from Rose. Unfortunately, she's not she's not here. However, she is Wailaki Pomo and Maidu. She's an amazing cultural leader out of Sonoma County where we are. And she's been working in Indian education for a long time. Um, she's also working with Redbud on a number of projects that we have coming up. Our other panelists, we have Hilo Ramirez. Hi, Hilo. And Hilo is Machukta, and he's a TEK practitioner. He has a, has a Bachelor of Science in Biology. He also has a single subject credential in Biology and Life Sciences. He is a published researcher who's focused on the Valley Oak Tree. The oak Tree is you know, very important to Native people in California. Um, and he's an incredibly intelligent person. I really enjoyed getting to know Hilo for the last couple of weeks. And then we also have Irma, who you know, she introduces, introduced herself uh, before, and she's worked in Indian Ed for a long time as well, 15 years. And Irma brings a unique perspective to the conversation because she's a parent. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get some of that perspective in here. So on that note, we'll get started. Yes. All right. I just have to do some rearranging real quick. And the way the panel will work is I have a couple questions that I've prepared. However, at the end, we'll take specific questions from the audience, either about the guide, about Redbud, for the panelists, whatever. So um, the first question that we are going to discuss is, uh, what do you remember about school? And in particular, what do you remember about how you learned about Native people? I, I can go, I'll go first. Um, first thing I, I, I just want to mention when the discussion um, about the curriculum and as a, as a parent and those parents that are out there, uh, the curriculum is a training tool for the schools to um, better equip the teachers on our on our children and if you have any input or suggestions from a parent perspective by all means this is just a first copy of this because this can go on this information to the teachers and to the educators is so important. We had a discussion earlier about where this should start. And working in Indian education and being a parent, it's why are they still teaching this in school? Why are the teachers teaching about, and nothing, to, <laughs> nothing against those those tribes outside of California, but they're teaching about Navajos, they're teaching about the Plains, and we're in California. And so it's always nice to start um, from a parent's perspective to start at home where, where we are, who our kids are. And so I always tell my kids to, um, to speak up, uh, my daughter to speak up when they were in school, my son to speak up on who they are and where they come from as um, Indian students. Because if they don't, then nobody's going to know. And as a parent, you want your kids to feel comfortable in school. As they get 
into the junior highs and the high schools and they're learning this information, it would be nice for the teachers to understand where they're where they're coming from, and um, and I know that when my kids were in school, it was no, you're not going to do a missions project. You're not going to do this and that. I want you to do something from who um, from your tribe, from who on who you are, and um, because. These are kids that you're going to be living with in your community. These are families that you're gonna, that we are going to be involved with, whether it's sports or or just in the community. You know, seeing them um, so that they know who you are and you be proud of, and you know, for you to be proud of who you are. So the main thing is understanding and giving that information first from your community whether you're Yurok, Karuk, you're Maidu, you're Wintu, you're Pomo, you know, for those, for the teachers to let their kids know who their next door neighbor is, is always, is always important. And then as an educator, it's this, it's the same thing is that I always want people to know who they, like the land base, where are you, where are you at? Who are you in, involved with? And so parents that are out there, are, you know, feel comfortable in, in speaking up, you know, let your teachers know that your kids just went to ceremony and that they're tired. You know, they're not being lazy. They're not, yeah, they're sleepy. It's because they participated in ceremony all, all weekend, and those are important. Those are, edu that's an education for our families, for our communities, and the communities need to have a, the, a general, inf need to have general information of, um, of who we are as, as a Native family. So I know that growing up, having my kids grow up, it was trying to, being shy at, as, a, as a young person, but being an advocate as a parent, being an advocate for my kids as, um, as they went through school, because it wasn't a good thing. Um, one more example was my daughter played in the band and <laughs> they did the tomahawk chop. Oh my gosh, she was so embarrassed. She goes, mom, she came home and said, mom, they want me to do this and um, I, I can't. And, I said, well, then educate, go and educate the, the band teacher, go and educate the school on how inappropriate that is and how Indian people feel about something like that. And she did, and they stopped it for, for a while. So you as a parent can support your kids and make a difference. And, and as educators um, listening to Indian people, to, in, to your students on, um, they may not engage with you because these things happen. And um, so just to be sensitive uh, about those kinds of things, it's, it's traumatic for the little kids. You know, um, same thing with the hair. My son would come home and I want my hair cut. It's like, why? Well, they keep pulling on my hair. They keep, you know, calling me a girl. And I said, well, you just have to tell them you're not a girl, you're a boy. And this is something that we believe in, that boys also have long hair in our communities and in our family. We're a long hair family, you know, some families are short hair family, but we're a long hair family and it's okay. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I want to I want to touch really quickly before we go to Hilo about something that Irma mentioned, which is that you, you started telling that story about being in ceremony for the weekend and being tired. And in the book, we um, we spoke with some people. This is a story that has popped up with many Native families that we've spoken to. Um, and I actually remember it specifically with a student that I had as well when I was teaching, where a student would come into class uh, 
after the weekend and would be super, super tired. I mean, it's like all kids are like that, but this kid was especially tired, you know, like head on the desk, couldn't get up, couldn't wake this person up, couldn't keep him awake when he was awake. And, um, you know, as a teacher, my first reaction was to like get frustrated. I got frustrated. And as I spoke with the student, had meetings, you know, talk with the family, it uh, kind of came to light that the kid was doing this. He was participating in weekend ceremonies and he was actually thought of as one of the older kid like leaders for the, for the younger kids in his native community. And so while at school, as a teacher who wasn't asking the right questions, who wasn't asking questions at all, I was getting frustrated and maybe thinking about like how I was going to deal with this classroom management issue when in reality the kid was was a leader. He had a lot of amazing leadership qualities. They just weren't for whatever reason coming out in my classroom. And so I'm really happy that you brought that up Irma because that's a part of that deficit mindset that we're we're trying to, you know, start a conversation about today. Okay, so Hilo, what do you remember about school? <laughs> You're in school still too. Yeah, uh, so first thing that I can remember uh, in first time even Native Americans being brought, brought up in the curriculum was fourth grade in California because that's when we learn about California Indians and then it's the mission project and then also the gold rush. So the mission project, I don't know if people not from California are familiar, every fourth grader has to make a mission. It's been like that way for like at least 20 years because I'm over 20 years old. So ever since when I was back in fourth grade. Uh, and they want you to glorify the missions by making a mission. You don't actually learn anything. You just learn, oh, some school, some cool Spanish Padres come over here. And then they actually taught the natives English and they gave them work. They taught them agriculture. So that's really cool. And they, they kind of just leave it at that. And I remember being very frustrated with that because I knew that was a blatant lie. And uh, I kind of, I don't know if y'all remember, but at least back in the 90s and early 2000s, they used to sell these little plastic figurines, like little cowboys and Indians and little army soldiers. So uh, when I made my mission, I bought the cowboys and I had them whipping with their uh, whip, the natives on the mission. And then I was like going to bring it to school. And then the teacher's like, you can't do that. I'm like, that's that, this is historically accurate. This is, this is the truth. What you're trying to push, I think my dad ended up talking to them. And then I think I was like excused from the project because they didn't want, because we had them all displayed in the library for like a year and the school didn't want that on display for a year. But uh, okay. looking back at now, it's kind of funny, but I can see that's like the first time that I started like acting out. I saw an injustice, I saw a blank line and then I tried to do that. So I know like with a lot of native youth, when we see blank lies in the curriculum, we're going to act out and I think that's one of those uh, classroom management things to keep in mind is if you want to know why they're acting out most of the time it's you know I do if it's not due to the external factors like completely internal it's curriculum uh, another thing is the gold rush so another thing I remember is learning about John Sutter and then Sutter's Mill and gold being found on Sutter's Mill and then you just oh yeah, John Sutter, great person, started the gold rush, blah, blah, blah. And they kind of skipped over the fact that he had uh, Maidu sex slaves that were children, youngest being eight years old. Uh, he had a few thousand Maidu and Miwok slaves. Because even though after the Civil War, it was technically illegal for slavery to exist, California made their own laws to bypass that. Uh, they were vagrancy laws. So any Native American found without work, would you could catch them and then enslave them because you're giving them a job. And then also children would be able to be enslaved because the children were in families that were homeless because they weren't living in a brick and mortar house. Anyhow, knowing that John Sutter enslaved thousands of my people and then that he had child sex slaves, it wasn't real nice to hear all the cool things that he did for California. So skipping over that part uh, was very, you know, frustrating as a native student, just sitting there in the class and having to listen to that. Uh, and then uh, it didn't get brought up again until high school. And then we learned about US history and then it kind of got glossed over. It's like manifest destiny, Native Americans were in the way and they stopped existing, <laughs> end of story. Uh, didn't talk about Native Americans again until college. And then even when I was in my credential program at Chico State, I had a class and one of the professors said, yeah, for this, I want you to learn, it, like we're doing, doing a cultural project, like pick a, non-white cultural ethnic group and then do a presentation about them and then he's mentioned that in years past one group did a project on the Maidu and how they used to live and how they used to exist and 
uh, how they used to occupy like this land in Butte County. And he didn't know that we were still here. And then I was Machupta in the class. So Machupta is the tribe from Chico, California. So I had a professor talking about how there used to be Native Americans here and they're not longer here. And I was just sitting in the class, just like, all right, I guess I'm, uh, I'll just let myself out. I don't exist. Well, <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's my experiences, mostly in elementary school. Uh, and then it's the lack of uh, curriculum for me. It's just, it's not talked about in the history classes other than Manifest Destiny and just kind of glossing over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my experience uh, is pretty similar to Hilo because we're the same age. So we, we kind of went, we went through the California public school system at the same time. So we were getting similar stuff. Um, I'm going to point out a couple of things that I remember that were positive, actually, that, that despite the like really traditional mission curriculum and gold rush curriculum, um, stick in my mind as things that, that made me excited to be native in the classroom. So in fourth, and when I was in fourth grade, we went on a weekend trip to Coloma, which is a gold, an old gold rush town in the Sierra Nevadas near Auburn. And, um, you know, I might be filtering things out. I'm sure there were some very strange things that we learned about the gold rush. And I'm sure native people were brushed over in some ways. However, one night during this trip, they brought in a local native person. Uh, he was Nisanan. And that person sat around the fire and told all of the fourth graders in the school some traditional stories and some traditional songs. And um, after, after the, the like fire wrapped up, my dad, because my dad was a chaperone, my dad took me to introduce myself to the man. And when I said my name, he said, I grew up with your great grandmother. And that was so special because like, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it because I was seen right? It was a moment in education where no one else in my class knew that I was Native. It wasn't a thing that I talked about. But in that moment, an elder was able to communicate with me, you know, that this is where you're from. Your family reaches back as far, you know, as far as time can extend to this very place. And so it was kind of a really nice moment of connection. So that was really, really memorable for me. And then another, uh, kind of positive shift in my education was going to college actually. So I was, uh, I went to school in San Francisco at a pretty progressive school and I was a literature student and I did take a course, a couple courses where there were books written by native authors, like poetry books. We got to learn about Joy Harjo, who was the po poet laureate in the United States. If you're not familiar with her, I recommend looking her up. And then also Louise Edrick, and we got to read some of her novels. So having that experience of engaging with Native art and literature and seeing that Native people were creating things of substance that I could see myself reflected in, and it was in the classroom, like non-Native people had to read it, and they liked it. They learned from it, you know, was that was a really a uh, positive experience for me. So I just wanted to uplift that in case there are any teachers here who are kind of thinking that in that way. Um, so second question is, what do you wish you had learned? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on Hilo first on this one because uh, Hilo has a teaching credential in science and I think has a lot of ideas about this question. So I'm gonna put you on the spot, Hilo. What do you wish that you had learned about native people in school? Uh well, what I wish I learned was mainly just how we're such great scientists uh, and then our land management practices and how intricate they are. Uh, with the new uh, standards that have been set forth uh, within science the last few years for uh, middle for high school at least, uh, one of the new standards is talking about feedback loops, positive and negative feedback, feedback loops. And then our traditional land management practices of tending to like willow and redbud that's a feedback loop. So use fire or cutting to generate a new straight growth. And then you keep on doing that and it makes the plant healthy. And you get this feedback loop where you always have new basket material and the plant's always healthy. But then if you exit that uh, loop by not taking care of it, it leads to overgrowth. It grows over itself. It gets all curvy and gnarly. And that actually increases infection of it, which in turn makes it more susceptible to infection, which and usually ends up to it dying. So you can study feedback loops just by looking at indigenous land management practices. Uh, not only that, but also using fire to kill weevils from acorns. I could go on, but 
uh, just integrating uh, traditional eco ecological knowledge into that or just plainly learning about the organisms that are in my area. Uh, I didn't understand why in high school I was learning about Darwin finches and character displacement and beaks in the Galapagos when I'm never going to visit South America. I don't know how many poor rural folk in rural California are going to the Galapagos. Maybe we could have learned about character displacement and beaks within waterfowl in California. We have millions of waterfowl. They all land in the same wetlands, but they all have different shaped beaks and they all feed different ways like uh, northern shovelers. They're uh, filter feeders. They skim the bottom and filter feed. You have your dabblers, you have your divers, and they're all finding little niches in the exact same pond, the wetlands. So they evolve those to feed on different food sources, just like the Darwin finches. So doing place-based learning, I wish I was able to do that in California. And then also with the social studies aspect, in Butte County alone, a lot of our locations have Maidu names. We have uh, Nimshu, uh, which is over by Paradise, which burned down in the campfire. Uh, we have a city called Concow, which is an uh, anglicized version of the word Konkawi. Uh, so is Nimshu, it's Nemsewi. But we have all these place names that are uh, native names, but it was never acknowledged. So when we learned about the local geography, it would have been nice to have that mentioned. Great, Hila, thank you. Irma? I, I think that it would have been nice to know that we, well, that society knew that we still existed, that we weren't then, that we are now, um, was, was very important. Um, you know, yeah, growing up, it was, it was always they were, 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 instead of um, they are. And um, I think that that, and knowing and that they would know the, the difference, I think because of the culture they were, when people knew that we are, they would be scared. Like, you know, little kids are always scared uh, because of the stereotypes of, of the television shows, the, you know, Indians were, were savages and they were going to um, kill you. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that, wasn't, that wasn't the case. I remember when we would get introduced or I would get in, introduced as an Indian person, the little kids would just be afraid you know, of, of you because of what they, they were seeing on, on television. So those stereotypes just, um, and even now, even now when we're in regalia and we're, um, you know, the mom or the dad or the family is trying to introduce them, you know, to uh, a person that's in regalia and, you know, an Indian person that's in regalia, those little kids are just scared and it shouldn't be that way. You know, what if we were to do the opposite as Indian people, we we're introduced to um, a non-Indian and, you know, we would shy away or be scared. They would think that that was, you know, what was wrong. Um, and like I said, it, it shouldn't be that way. So I think that that would be the, the main, the main thing. And, and I think, yeah, I'm going to, I think I'm going to leave that there. Um, leave it at that because that was real hurtful. If it wasn't like that, it would have, it would have been a lot, uh, would have been a lot better. Sorry, I'll go ahead and round out uh, this this question because um, I agree with both of those answers. But uh, another thing that I think would be really great to see is examples examples of contemporary Native existence. So, like I brought up, I brought up the book example, but there's a, a there are a couple people here in the audience who are 
like experts at young adult literature, for example. Um, there's so much good young adult literature that's coming out that is written by native people that um, don't just talk about, you know, general, I mean, there are def definitely like just human themes that I think everyone can relate to, but also a lot of native people are raising ethical questions in their work that um, are really worth grappling with like the concept of blood quantum, that you have to be able to quantify the parts of your body in order to belong to a group or not. The idea of citizenship and how does this play out in both the United States, but how is it playing out in tribal nations? And how does the concept of citizenship bring families together and also tear them apart? These are things that are really present in Indian country that, uh, cause a lot of drama and politics in native nations that every single person I think in the United States can really benefit from examining. So examples of, of native art, native literature, native politics, um, just anything that's like native people exist and, and our problems are actually uh, problems that a lot of people, that we can learn from and that a lot of people can learn from and there's a lot of humanness in them. So, um, yeah, hope that made sense. Um, so we're going to go to a third question, which is, uh, so there's a, there are a lot of native people in this audience and there's a lot of, there are a lot of non-native people in this audience and there are a lot of people that are interested in education. So this next question is, is, is kind of to help people who want to take the next step and who want to try to support, um, implementing these changes into schools that you've suggested Hilo and Irma. So what, what do you want people to know? What do you want people to do? How can they help? Um, I'll, I'll start. I, I think that understanding as a, as a teacher, um, understanding that in, that we're not casino people. I, I think that that is um, a big uh, stereotype is that you know all the Indian Indians all get money and they're taken care of by the U.S. government and in reality that's not true. There's a lot of commun native communities that um, that are suffering uh, that don't have casinos that you know get into that that are stereotyped as oh you have money you don't need help, but I, I think. The main thing would be for educators to have an open mind of, of Indian people, of Indian culture, and ask questions that you don't know. And it's and it's okay, you know, to ask in a respectful way to those students or to those families um, what you don't understand, because what you don't know you don't understand. And it could be um, a falsehood. It could be something that's, that doesn't even pertain to that teach, to that community or to that family. And to realize that there are a lot of different nations, even in California, because of the relocation um, into California from the plains, from um, from all over the United States. I mean, people were were relocated from Oklahoma to San Francisco, and from oh, Montana, all those places. You know, Midwest into California because there were there were jobs. They wanted to assimilate them. And um, so they moved them, you know, if you move them out of their environment, then, you know, they have to learn. They thought that they, you know, that they could assimilate them and, and, and survive. And it was really hard for families for that, um, for them to become assimilated into um, mainstream society because they had their own societies at home and um, and they were taken from there so that they could they could survive. So just know that not everybody, not all Indian people are the same. They're, 
they're not because even when you look at my view, you have the valley, you have the mountain, you have, you know, the just all there's different ones. Um, people on the other side of the mountain, people on this side of the mountain. <laughs> I mean, you can go 10 miles and they are mighty, but they're different. You know, they come from different villages and um, you can't lump them all as native people, but then you can't even lump them all as Maidu people or Yurok people or Pomo people because they come from upriver, downriver in the valley and the mountains and they speak different languages. So just because somebody is Maidu, um, they're not all the same. They're not all the same. They have different, they come from different villages and, um, you know, and that they were also matriarchal societies, you know, and that's very important because sometimes people won't make a decision. They'll have to wait and ask their grandma or their auntie or their mom. And that's just the way, that's just the way it is. So I think those would be the important. And, you know, the main thing is to ask questions. If you don't know, there's there's the all the different tribes in this area. There's the Indian Ed Center, Four Winds. There's you know the the Tribal TANF office has information. There's just you know Chico State, the same thing. It's all you have to do is ask and get an understanding, um, and that would that would help build a, a positive relationship between the schools and the teachers and the community. Yeah, I'm, I'm really anywhere. glad that you, I'm glad that you brought that up and started listing some of the different organizations and places that people can go for support because something that we really emphasize in the book in the in the third section, the, the, the tips for educators is having some connection with your school, from your school uh, with the broader native community. And, and most districts, um, have an Indian ed program, at least in California. I don't know what it's like in other places, but like, for example, I worked in San Francisco, Francisco there is an Indian ed depart, uh, office, you know, in the, in, the, in the school district building, same with in Butte County. And those places offer services. They might host a PAC parent association, you know, committee meetings with native parents. Those are really good things to be tapped into as an educator so that you can start building that relationship and also get native kids um, different types of support that they may need because they offer like food, tutoring, family services, things like that. Most cities are gonna have cultural centers as well. So here in Santa Rosa, we have the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center. That's a great place to go if you want support with cultural uh, competency materials. We created a curriculum for them as well. And then they also have exhibits on local California native issues and movements. Um, so most cities have things like that. Another really important uh, service that is most likely in the town or city that you live in is some kind of health clinic, an Indian health clinic. They're not everywhere, but they they are around. And Indian health clinics also offer support to families and they might offer cultural information and services like that. So if you're totally new to this and you're like, I don't know where to reach out, I don't know this system, it doesn't apply to me, those are the three places that I would start. All right, Hilo. All right, uh, I just want to second everything that Irma said, uh, kind of took what I was going to say away from me, but I think everything she said was very important. I just want to add, uh, just add a little deeper, just the complexity of uh, Native American identity. So uh, when people ask uh, how I identify, I say Machupta, and that is because that's the tribe that I'm enrolled in. Uh, federally recognized tribes are sovereign nations, so I actually have dual citizenship being Machupta isn't like a club. I am a citizen of the Machupta nation. However, I'm also a uh, Yamani Maidu, Mount Maidu. Uh, my grandpa Sherman Wilson, who's Machupta, married a woman named Lenore Jack, who's uh, Mount Maidu, and then they came down to Chico. So even though I say I'm Machupta, it's, a little, it's more complex because I'm also uh, descended from people that are Mount Maidu and people that are Wailaki and such. So 
it's very if I had to name every single tribe that I have an ancestor from, it would be a long list. So to simplify, I say Machupta, but yeah. Uh, and then we're also very uh, unique with our identity. So when I say Machupta, like I'm very familiar with all the natural resources in the Big Chico Creek and uh, Butte Creek watershed, uh, where the valley meets the foothills and the mountains. But say if I went up to Mount Maidu territory, I wouldn't know a thing. So like, even though I'm Maidu, I wouldn't go up to my, Mer Mount Maidu territory and be like, I am the expert. I would leave that to them. So uh, just that location-wise, it's important to know. Uh, don't assume that you know your student just because they're Native American. Like. Uh, I've had instances of fellow Maidu students in Butte County tell me that while in school, the teacher played uh, Plains Indian powwow music and then said, oh, this is your people's music, right? You like this? And they're Maidu, that, that our music is nothing like that. So assuming that we're like how Hollywood depicts us in that Plains Indian culture is uh, hurtful. Uh, and then again, ask questions. Uh, if you don't know their uh, how they identify as a Native American, just be, like ask like, do you have a tribal affiliation or something? Uh, but yeah, we're all unique. So just getting to know us on a unique level is important, I think. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so this at this time, we can take a few questions. Um, so if you have a question, maybe you can put it in the chat and, and we can read it out and we can talk about it. Um, maybe while we wait for people to do questions, we can raffle off an item just in case people want to process. Yeah. All right. Second raffle of the night. All right. Those are beautiful. Irma, do you want to uh, tell us about those earrings? Well, I get a number. <laughs> so these are made, um, they're abalone uh, rounds on the bottom with uh, faceted glass beads in the middle, um, also be glass, they're all made with glass beads. And then this is the bare grass braid. And then uh, this one actually has a, a, a little leather piece on the top that connects it to the ear wire. Beautiful. Oh. All right. Winner. So the winner of these beautiful earrings is number 10 which is Stephanie uh, Esquivel. I really hope I pronounced that right. Uh, are you here, Stephanie? Oh, it does not look like Stephanie is here anymore. Um, all right, I will email Stephanie about her winning that. Let me write that down real quick. Let's do another one, Irma, that's fun. Okay. Um, all right, a lanyard, another lanyard. This one is uh, black pine nuts with red glass beads, the clasp on the bottom. Again, the black pine nuts, we, when we go out and gather the pine nuts in order to get them black, we have to fry them. So before we fry them, uh, we have to make sure that there's a hole in it. So we have to drill a hole in the pine nut uh, because if not, it'll pop and break and it could splatter on you. And we don't want that to, I don't want, I don't want that to happen to me. Again, glass beads, dentilium. Dentilium was a form of payment um, back in the day. So they would um, barter or trade with dentilium shell. Uh, they, the dentilium shell was also used, um, is used on in making not only jewelry, but also regalia, necklaces, uh, put on the dresses for the girls. You have uh, a longer triangle piece. These are black, um, black triangles. Again, they're glass beads, more dentilium. Oops, oops, and <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see who's going, well, who's gonna get this shipped to them. <laughs> um, <laughs> black pine nuts and again the leather um, back. All right so the winner of this beautiful piece is Guadalupe Costco. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Send me your email. You can email it to me or uh, direct message it to me. And just a plug, Lupe uh, is an awesome 
uh, person. She works for a, a pretty cool uh, environmental education nonprofit here in Santa Rosa. And Lupe also just spent the last two months developing an, uh, another project with us that's called Going Beyond Land Acknowledgements that we're going to release soon. And it's an organizational assessment and toolkit for organizations to think about the quality of their relationships with local native people, and then also identify ways that they can start building those relationships in case that, in case you don't have them. Um, and it, it's very likely that maybe you don't. So uh, Lupe is, is very intelligent. She, she helped us a lot with that and keep on the lookout for that resource in March. Great. And is, is there, there's two more or one more Irma? You're muted. There's two more. So this one is, uh, oops, turquoise, uh, bear grass earring, bear grass braid earrings. Uh, with the fish hook earrings on the top uh, for a low price of nineteen ninety nine. <gasps> oh my gosh! I could be I could be one of those um, yeah, I'm like QVC people or QVC. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyways, with a mother of pearl shell on the bottom. You're so pretty. Is what it All is. right. So okay. the winner of these beautiful earrings is number twenty one. Laura Beam McKinney. Are you here, Laura? I, I think you are because I looked your name up. Laura, Laura is here. Cool. Great. Yeah, and Laura is a special education teacher in San Francisco. And uh, I know all these people, I'm really excited. Uh, <laughs> And uh, is also a young adult book expert. She read like she probably read like a hundred young adult books last year. She reads like no one else I've ever met. Um, and she's in a really awesome resource. She has a blog called Everybody Books, and you can look it up. And it has it has mm. all these young adult books categorized by um, by like different identities. So there's things. Like she probably has a section that's about books written by native people, to be honest. So if you had a, someone had a question about that, I saw in the chat, go to everybody books, Laura's at everybodybooks.com.org, something like that. So you can go in there and she'll have a list of uh, books by native people that you can look up that are great for teaching. You're there, the last one. Yes. yes the, last one. the last one. Okay. The last one is another mask holder. So you've got your little um, hooks on the on the end to put on your mask. This one's more of a, a burgundy color. It might look brown, dark brown, but um, it is actually bur burgundy. It has mother of pearl rice beads on there. Uh, there we go. Um, some smaller triangles. Uh, grass braid, uh, some more mother of pearl, there they go, rice beads, and another set, whoops, 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 and then the bottom. Yeah. Very cool. It goes over your neck, you put it on your mask, and then um, that's where it lays, and then <laughs> you put it on, take it off, put it on. <laughs> awesome. They were. Um, well. And so the winner of this beautiful piece is finally someone that I know personally, Omalara. Um, so Omalara is in the Chang Fellowship with me over at Harvard. She's a doctoral student and her um, intervention that she's working on is called Thrive. It's really phenomenal. I highly recommend looking into it. If you Google her name, it'll come up and you can look into it there. And uh, Omalara, if you want to email me or DM me your address, I can get that sent out to you. Well, now that we've had the opportunity to plug all of our friends, <laughs> right? <laughs> Through the raffle. Um, <laughs> uh, we, so that was the end of the raffle. I am going to give one more plug for the book, which is why we're all here. Uh, yeah. So Irma and Nathan gave a lot of support in us creating this book, seeing our native students, a guide for educators. Um, you know, we really hope that you'll check it out. Remember it's on our website, redbudresourcegroup.org, PDFs free. If you want a hard copy, you can purchase it. Um, we really hope that we can, uh, that you'll check it out. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us over our website. So 
Uh, are there any other questions? If somebody wants to make a comment too, like I know that there are other teachers in the room and there are lots of um, representatives from the native community. So we can also take comments if you have something that you would like to add to the conversation that hasn't been added yet. Um, if that's the case, maybe raise your hand and we can call on you. There, there is a question that came through during the raffle call off um, from Ariana uh, Dinsons. I'm terrible at pronouncing things. I'm so sorry if I did that wrong. But um, so their question is, from what I've learned so far, teachers are often expected to adhere strictly to certain curricula due to teaching to the test. And it can jeopardize their career if they spend too much time on non-curriculum items at the expense of uh, curriculum-based items. If a teacher in public ed does get in trouble for teaching too much about Native people, and there's lots of air quotes around here, uh, is there anyone in particular they should go to in order to challenge the situation? That's a great question. What does the panel think? I'm gonna um, add to that. I, I think when you're looking at the channels is one of, of course, go to the curriculum committee in your school district and do the pitch of, uh, of how, this how this curriculum supplements the curriculum that you're, that you're doing. Um, that you're using so that you do meet the standards for the state, you know, I'm just because we're in California, what the standards are for the Department of Education. Um, but again, it, talk to your curriculum committee and see how you can do this. The other is talk to your principals to see how you can get a training on implementing this information. Uh, because there's always staff development going to uh, the resources that will um, that will support the curriculum that you're working on or you wanting to use because you want to support your native students. Native students have the highest dropout rate um, in the country. And the goal is to keep them in school. And if you can keep them in school by um, by acknowledging their existence, by acknowledging who they are and where they come from and the land that the school district is on. I mean, that's always a positive there. Uh, so staff development, bringing it up, making sure that they, that the school does have time to do staff development for um, the native population. Because there's, according to the schools, there's very little known. And the other is, I mean, the, the long haul is to get it adopted by the school, by the Department of Education under their curriculum, under your representatives because there is a school board, you know, California has a school board and I'm sure every school dis, every department of education for the states have a school board. And to go there and talk to them about educating teachers on native, native communities, native people, uh, the people that or the land that the school district sits on or that the capital sits on. I mean, there's the smaller would be staff development, then going to your representatives or to the, you know, the superintendents, going to the, the Department of Education and the school board I mean, it's a long process to get it to to get it approved, but you have to start somewhere. I mean, our students are um, are I don't want to say that they, well they are they're failing they're failing in the schools because they're being devalued in our in in the school district by doing the missions by doing you know not allowing. Hilo's project to sit in the library because of its um, authenticity. 
you know those things are are important people think that in or you know kids think that indian people are bad and it's and it's not because and it's because of the stereotypes and when you try and put a reality in there that indian people were massacred and blah 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 they don't want to hear it and um but yeah we feel it all the time we experienced it we you know we have to um we have to give our kids an understanding of it's okay, you know, even though we don't want to, because if we challenge them, we're a problem. That's the thing. Our kids feel like our kids will get picked on. We're, oh, there comes that mom or dad. They're a problem. You know, they just want for their kids. And that's not true. We just want to be heard. We want it to put out there that this is, um, this is a reality. You know, when they say get over it, <laughs> How can you get over it if you don't acknowledge it? So start small, staff development. Yeah, I actually have a couple of things to add to that, Irma, that are in the book. A staff development is definitely one of the suggestions that we like repeat over and over again. But uh, my favorite workaround with this issue of like, there's not native history in, in standards in every, in every grade, that's fine. But there is science in every single grade. And native people are extremely scientific. And I mean, my argument would be like, it's really in any science class, first of all, that you're teaching, you can integrate indigenous concepts uh, into the science classroom quite easily. And I really like, I I'll, while I think that usually the focus of this conversation is how do we tell the history accurately? I would argue that actually it's more, even more, even more important to focus on shifting the narrative towards indigenous strengths in science and in ecology, because it's so much the root of our culture and our way of existing in the world. And it's also, by the way, one of the major solutions to our future living in a changing climate. So my answer to that would be to figure out how to integrate indigenous science perspectives into your science classroom, not just into your English or your history classroom. And then, you know, if people push back about that, remember like your school sits on the land of people who were forcibly and illegally removed from that space so that your school, so that your city, so that your town could exist there. And so it is the very least that we could do when teaching science to emphasize the contributions of those people and how they how they relate to that school subject. So I, I guess what I would what I'm saying to wrap it up is um, to try to, we want to try to expand our understanding of where native people fit into content. It's not just in English class or science or history class. It's in math class, it's in science class, it's in it's in PE, right? Like our people have a long history of sports. We invented a lot of sports. And so there are so many different ways to integrate this perspective um, that start to uh, become more apparent when we like open our minds to it and start, start learning about it. Um, and then somebody also asked a question about like how do we protect our students from uh, trauma responses when talking about the accurate version of history. And that's really tricky. I don't think I have a perfect answer to it, but one offering I have there is um, to really focus on the resilience of Native people and the ways that Native communities banded together to overcome the challenges that were presented to them throughout history. So that's like, instead of being like, oh, we're gonna tell the real story of the missions and now we're gonna talk for three days about how violent and terrible and how many people were raped by the Spanish. Like that's one way that you can tell the accurate history. Another way to tell the accurate history is to be like, look at what, the, uh, look at what this tribe did while they were basically incarcerated and like forced into slavery to protect their language. Look what they did to protect their spirituality and their religious practices. Look what they did to protect their families. And really kind of focusing on like those community strategies. Um, I think that's like one way to take, take on that really terrible, violent history without putting so much emphasis on the colonizer and what they did and how terrible they were. 
focus on what native people did well. We wouldn't exist like Hilo and I's people wouldn't have, ex wouldn't, we wouldn't exist unless our people figured out how to survive the gold rush. So thinking about that, that would be my suggestion. Hilo, did you have anything to add? Um, I don't, uh, okay, I do. So <laughs> I'm more on the side, so that, so uh, Taylor's response is one take. I'm more on the side of teaching kids the truth. Like you don't have to get into the gory details, but I don't know, like I remember fourth grade was the first grade in California where we had sex ed, sexual education. And I believe strongly that in sex ed, like in, in education, you should actually also talk about affir affirmative consent and then talk about what is sexual assault because a lot of kids get sexually assaulted and they don't know what it is because they're never actually told what it is. And yeah, anywho, uh, I believe it, from like an affirmative consent standpoint, you can be like, okay, these peoples did not consent to what happened to them and then take upon that. And I think it should still be taught, my personal belief, uh, but you don't have to get into the gory details. Like, you know, like, yeah, the kid was forced to do things that they didn't want to do and that's a bad thing. Uh, but yeah, just, I think that more harm is done by not talking about it than by talking about it. Just because a lot of excuses that I hear is they're too young in fourth grade to hear about all the atrocities that happened to the Native Americans. And then high school happens, they're like, oh, okay, can you talk about it now? And they're like, oh no, it's not part of the curriculum in high school. They get taught that in fourth grade. It's like, okay, but they never actually get taught anything because you're saying that they're too young to be taught it in fourth grade, but now that they're old enough to be taught it, you don't teach it, so. Yeah, great points, absolutely. Um, cool, well, this is a really great conversation. Thank you both for joining us and thanks for uh, all the audience members who who are here um it means a lot to us and it's so great to see familiar faces um yeah thanks for coming uh i i think we're gonna wrap it up it's 8 31 again our our book is available on our website redbudresourcegroup.org. Uh, looking into the future, we are also working with four winds to create an online video version of the guide so within the next couple months, probably in June, we're going to release an online course that's going to have 10 to 15 mini videos, like five minutes or less, that are explaining some of the concepts and the guides and that also have uh, like supplementary questions so that you can use it in a professional development setting if you want, or you can use it for your own personal education. And then, of course, uh, if you feel like you need a actual Native person to come in and work with you and help, uh, we can also work to to develop some kind of plan like that where we can come in, come into Zoom and, and train. So thanks again for all the support. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm impressed because everyone stayed the whole time, which is, which is pretty good for Zoom, for Zoom event. <laughs> so we're going to stick on for like five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. So if you have another question for us, you can just uh, turn your mic on and, and ask. I have to. Um, Maddie has to go, but I'll be here. Uh, I don't have to go. I have to allow people to unmute themselves. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, now, now you can unmute and ask a question. Uh, but also, if you're, if any of you are interested in following our work at Radbud, um, you can go to our website, redbudresourcegroup.org. You can follow us on Instagram at Redbud Resource Group, and the same goes for Four Winds. If you're interested in following their work, you can uh, go to their website, which is. Um, Four winds of native ed.org. I'm pretty sure. Sorry. I just <laughs> that. Irma, do you know what the website is? Maybe put it in the chat. I did a while ago. Oh, I was right. Yeah. It's four winds of Indian education.org. Can I um, unmute Crystal? Yeah. Okay. She should be able to unmute herself as well. Okay. If that's not working, let me know. Are you there, Crystal? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, hey. Perfect. Hey. Um, so my biggest question would be, um, I had my, my native culture taken from me family wise from drug abuse and just intergenerational trauma to the point where people that did know and that could educate me aren't here. Um, I'm 28 now. I have a four-year-old and, um, I'm currently trying to 
research and try to find my family essentially. Now I know that the kids and the youth that I'll be working with are definitely gonna be in very similar positions, especially if they're mixed. Um, I'm black as well. Um, so what kind of resources, I've been Googling a lot, um, but, and I'm also in Canada, but what kind of resources could I really use to try to bridge that gap or um, offer to the classroom to kind of ask the right questions? Because um, unfortunately, I know a lot of the parents, maybe I don't know, but I can speculate a lot of the parents wouldn't be interested in doing that. Um, but if they want to look for themselves, I do work with high schoolers, so they are definitely able to kind of do that themselves as well. So, so is your, um, sorry, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So is your question, uh, how, sorry, can you, can you repeat your question? Oh, sorry, I kind of went off a little bit. Um, okay. I'll be more concise. For students that are looking to, um, that know that they're Native or speculate that they're Native and they're looking more into it, Oh, I see. Um, what resources could they start with? Even just uh, resources to find acceptance first, because that was really hard for me to do. Yeah. Um, and I'm 28. <laughs> um, acceptance and then move on from that. I know it's not something I could maybe teach too much, but just something to offer as a resource. Sorry, as a resource. I see. Uh, I can offer something there. Um, I think for acceptance and you know feeling comfortable in the Native community, if you're not quite sure where your roots are, um, one of the first things that I've seen a, a lot of other people with this kind of situation do is they join, um, especially when they're students, they join Native student groups. Um, so most colleges um, and some high schools will have a Native student alliance or a Native student organization um, that they could start participating in. Uh, start volunteering with. There's also cultural centers that they could start working with. Um, you can join professional societies for Native people, such as uh, ACES, which is the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, or SACNIS, which is the Society for Advancing Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans. Those are both really, really, really wonderful groups that bring Native people, um, students all the way up to professionals together from all over the country uh, those are kind of more based in America, though. For Canada, yeah. I, I'm not sure if there's a good counterpart. Um, I for, into it. At least I have somewhere to start, so I appreciate right. that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then if they know the, the general area of which they came from, but they don't know the specific tribal nation, they can reach out to, um, you know, tribes in that area to see if there's people they could talk to. Maybe they know a great grandmother or great grandfather's name that they could ask, you know, were you familiar with this person? Um, try to find some more leads that way, but reaching out to the native community and trying to become part, like just participate more in the community could be a good place to start. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, I think like me, I don't have a perfect answer to that. Um, and I think that the, what you're describing is really, really common. Yeah. It's very, very common. And it's not our fault. Um, so I think that's really important to emphasize. And I, I totally agree with Maddie. I think finding meaningful actions and meaningful communities and meaningful ways to engage um, does a lot for healing that, that challenge. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. That really helps. I'll be taking that with the guide as well. So that's awesome. Um, Hilo, did you have any thoughts on that? Uh, it's a really tricky situation. Uh, and then I heard Canada. So I'm, are you, are you from Canada? Ontario, Canada, yes. Yeah. All right. So I don't know how it's done over there because that's a totally different country. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a broad uh, question, but even just like an idea can help me now know what I need to research. All right. I um, don't connect. Yeah. I know at least if, if you do know the general area so like say let's just use Machupa for example say that uh you have a, like a family thing where like your great grandma said that yeah we're Machupta but like we've lost the paperwork and something happened and whatnot at least in the United States uh the Bureau of Indian Affairs I don't know if there's an analogous organization in Canada for that there uh, is yeah okay at least here in the states uh the Bureau of Indian Affairs so the way that they usually uh have information is through census rules so they'll oh, actually make paperwork. Okay. 
because that's how they actually defined like what tribes are. They would take census rolls and be like, we were at this location, there were a hundred natives there and this is all the names. And they were very concerned with the population growth. So they're like keeping tracks every like five, 10 years. Like, is it decreasing? Is it decreasing? All right, it's decreasing. That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, but um, usually in the States, uh, a tribe's constitution, if they're federally or state recognized, will be based, have their enrollment off of some kind of census or uh, paperwork like that. So at least in the States, you're able to look at the BIA census rolls and then cross-reference that with the specific tribe, band, or First Nation, and then kind of work your paperwork back that way. Perfect. That's extra helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. I would also just like to add one little tidbit to the end here. Um, I would stay in contact with those students and try to build a good support network with each other because um, when you're reaching out to tribes that, you know, uh, I, I don't know how it is up in, um, up in Canada, but I know that tribes in America are all at different places when it comes with confronting the erasure, historical trauma, and forced separation of our peoples. And so when people that have been separated come back to the nation and try to start creating ties and rehabilitating those relationships, there can be a lot of tension. It can be an extremely emotional uh, thing to go through. And to have other people that are in the same situation to be there and offer their support throughout that process can be very meaningful and impactful. And if you want to reach out to other people that are in the, a similar context, uh, I, <laughs> I don't know how much I should advocate this, but there's a very large community like this on Twitter and Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, so reaching out to other students and other people in their, you know, mid to late 20s that are going through this period of uh, reestablishing their tribal identity and heritage and uh, relationships can be really important. So again, thank you so much. That's very, very helpful. Super. Uh, Sophia. Hi there. Um, I basically had the same kind of questions as Crystal. Um, so thank you very much for thoroughly going over that information. It actually, just hearing it has relieved a lot of anxiety, <laughs> um, you know, but I'm, you, you mentioned some groups. I'm wondering if either you can put it in the chat because I missed the acronyms and I'm trying to, I'm just kind of reaching out and searching as well, um, especially the ones not necessarily geared towards children or teenagers because I'm older you know what I'm saying? So I feel like I kind of missed the boat for having a mentor guiding me, but I'm just kind of trying to piece this together myself um, because I had a very disjointed past where it's like I have this very, um, like Crystal said, having this longing or like noticing a need to kind of understand, you know, native history and stuff and spending some time on the land and interpreting it and stuff like that. So It'd be really great to kind of get a little more resources to find my way in that. So anyways, thanks. Anyways, thank you for this program. It was really amazing. <laughs> thanks for coming. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Clint. Hi, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you all. Hi. All right. I think we have satisfied everyone's questions. Um, yeah, I, mean, I just want to, I know that like this isn't directly answering those, the Sophia and Crystal's question, but all my relations, like I always bring up that podcast just because it's really um, life changing and extremely affirming, I think, for, for Native people. All My Relations is a great podcast to listen to. Um, it is every episode really focuses, like it's very focused and rooted in contemporary Native identity and movements. So they interview artists, they interview activists, community organizers, but they also talk about issues like blood quantum. They talk about membership issues. They talk about family separation. They talk about adoption. Actually, like the, the woman who, Dr. Adrienne Keene, um, has a story of adoption. She's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation um, and has had to work very, very hard to reconnect with her cultural roots because she was adopted. And so there were a lot of things, there were a lot of chinks in the chain were miss missing, you know, information was not available to her and so uh she talks about that in the podcast and in other uh pieces of work that she does so that might be something that resonates with you as well
right. Dana, did, you want, did you want to speak, Dana? I see you unmuted. Yeah, I just figured out that I was muted and so I unmuted it <laughs> a little late. I didn't know I I could turn on my video until about halfway through too. But anyway, I'm learning, you know, a little slow in the draw here. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, any any last comments, thoughts, additions, questions? How are you doing, Amanda? Good. I'm just so happy to be here with you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. And yeah, thanks, thanks for everyone coming. For being here. And Amanda is also part of our team for building the Going Beyond Land Acknowledgements tool. So again, that is an it's like an assessment tool for organizations who know that they should be partnering more with Native people in one way or the other, but aren't really sure where they're at as an organization and also aren't really sure where to go. Right. So yeah, so we provide tons of suggestions for how you can bring native people into the conversations but also just to increase visibility as an organization because so many organizations have the power to increase visibility and make a difference but they don't do it and they don't know how to do it and they're not sure if they have the backing by their board or their other employees or whatever so amanda's worked with us to create something uh that can do that so yeah super all right i think it's time to close out the night uh, thank you all so much for coming here and, and spending this time with us. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, we hope that you've gotten as much out of this as we have. Yeah, um, yeah so have a wonderful night. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night. <laughs> yeah, stop sharing it. So.